Okay, hey students, so this is a quick video on uh, just some general tips to doing a uh, moment of inertia integrations. Uh, this is like the fifth take because it keeps not recording, so this one better record. I really hope it does. Uh, so essentially, what I'm going to be talking about is strategies to solve the i equals integral r squared dm problem, right? And I'm talking mainly strategies about getting good at it, right? Strategies to help you prepare for exams, strategies to help you study this sort of thing. Because uh, obviously the best way to study is to do it a lot of times. And the best kind of cases to start with are cases that you know the answer to. So what first recommendation that I have is when you're doing these problems for the first time, if you're self-studying, you should start with problems you already know the answer to. So for example, if you had a disc, right? Let's say we had like a, a, a arbitrarily flat disc and it was being rotated about the central point. Uh, it had a mass of m, a radius of r, then the moment of inertia, we know from kind of a definitional formula, is one half m r squared. But if you can take the integral form and show that that's equivalent, then you, know, you can make your way around the integral. And so my recommendation is to start with some known cases, start with the easiest ones. Like this is, this is one of the easiest ones there is and that's the one I'll demonstrate with, but start with some easy ones and then gradually get harder ones and then just do arbitrary ones. For example, um, when we do a rectangle, right? You can do a rectangle about the center and you can also do a rectangle about its uh, side and you can find the moment of inertia of one from the other using the parallel axis theorem. But you could also simply integrate it, right? You could do an integral to integral where your datum point, your zero point is at the end here so this is where r equals zero, Oop, didn't need the second zero there, uh, and show that it's equivalent to using the parallel axis theorem, right? So known cases don't have to be easy cases, but you won't get the answer and then wonder, am I correct or not, right? Or you won't get to the end and wonder if I'm correct or not. So that's something I really recommend for starting out. And you're going to, there, like there are tough enough questions, tough enough integral questions for you that you don't have to worry about hamstringing yourself on easy stuff. Now the second tip, um, is you're gonna want to be very comfortable in introducing variables, right? And this has two meanings. So the first is that you are going to have to convert dm into other stuff, right? And you can convert it into whatever you want, any other variable, right? So, I mean, obviously an element of mass is an element of density, which we assume doesn't change times an element of volume. Right, And then one can go, oh, well, I can express the volume as rho times, I don't know, dx, dy, dz, if you wanted to, right? If you want to do things Cartesian, or you can do rotational variables, whatever the spherical coordinates or, or cylindrical coordinates. But essentially you take this M and you make it into variables that you can integrate across, right? So for a disc, for example, we could do R and R and theta if we wanted to, right? You don't have to, because you're going to integrate over those variables anyway with known limits, those variables are going to come out, right? It doesn't matter if you're like, you, you can do a disk in Cartesian coordinates if you wanted to, right? It might be harder, but you'll still get the right answer, right? It'll just be that your limits are really weird and your relations are really weird, but you could integrate a disk in Cartesian coordinates and find the moment of inertia just fine. It'll just take longer, right? So don't be afraid to introduce whatever variables you want, right? Try things a few different ways. Um, cause it all just kind of comes out in the wash, uh, in terms of integrals, right? If you're integrating across a variable with known limits, then that variable's most likely going to disappear anyway. Um, the other thing is, is that you shouldn't be afraid of introducing, I guess, constants, not variables, but we'll call them variables, even though that's literally not what they are. And what I mean by this is, you notice I put a little row in there, right? I don't know what the row is of any of these given given items, right? But using a definitional relationship, like rho is by definition mass divided by volume, then I can substitute in this mass at a later state, right? So if I do an integral with rho dv, and I don't know, let's imagine I didn't bother going further than that, uh, and I got some blah, 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 blah that had some rho and some v in it, where v is like the total volume, right? I don't know, we'll call it vt or something. Then I can just substitute that in for m later and I've got my standard formula, right? Uh, or, I don't know, sigma, which we'll, let's say is the uh, surface air, surface density, right? The mass, mass per unit surface area, right? Uh, usually we use charge per area, right? So when you're doing um, 
uh, physics 1b and you're doing integrals to find, say, things according to Gauss's law, you can do this exact same thing. Right? These are just general integral strategies, actually, for a lot of first year physics integrals. Um, so those are kind of my two tips. Uh, and to show you, I'm going to do um, one. I'm going to do, let's do, ooh, clear page. That's a, that's a feature, isn't it? You learn something new every day. We're going to do a um, an integral of a disk, okay? So I want to find the moment of inertia of a disk. Now we know it's half m r squared, but let's do it, okay? So let's take a look at our disk. Well, let's let's draw a better one. Let's imagine we have a disk, All right? It's a big disk. It's 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 two dimensional, right? It's two dimensional for our purposes, so we don't care about the thickness, uh, and importantly, it is um, being spun directly about the central axis, okay? Now the integral that governs the total moment of inertia is r squared dm where dm is some random element of mass right I mean, technically it's a cube well, i don't know if it's a cube if i'm imagining it 2d it's probably like a square but whatever that's some element dm and that element is at some distance r from the center now if i want to express these elements in different variables Obviously, I'm going to use uh, cylindrical coordinates. Or technically, spherical coordinates is the same because it's 2D, but yeah, I'm not going to use Cartesian coordinates, right? I could use X and Y. We could do X and Y. Uh, that would just be really annoying, okay? But I don't know, challenge for you. Not challenge, but like, why don't you try it, right? It'd be annoying, but you could do it. Anyway, so my first task is to take this element dm and get it in terms of variables that I can integrate over. Right, because essentially what I want is to figure out a way of expressing this little element of mass in terms of other variables. So I'm actually going to close, like, delete this because I'm going to draw it from top down, right? Because it's two-dimensional, right? But if we imagine that we, this is just a cut out of the disk, right? If we imagine we have some infinitesimal little section here, right? This is our dm. That little section is going to be um, some sort of density, some area density, multiplied by some sort of little surface area, right? Let's say this thing has a little surface area dA, and that means that the little mass element has a mass of sigma dA, where here sigma, let's just call that the density. Uh, so sigma is gonna be equal to the total mass divided by the total area, right? So notice how I'm using little dA, this is our infinitesimal area, this is our infinitesimal mass, this is our total mass, and I'll just put little total area here just in case. So if I took that and I put it into the integral, we would have i is now equal to the integral of r squared sigma dA. Okay, because dm is equal to sigma dA and obviously sigma is a constant, so we don't need to worry about uh, converting it when we're doing our um, element conversion, when we're doing our variable conversion, right? So like dm is equal to sigma dA. So, okay, now we've got only dA and a constant, right? So we now need to integrate r squared dA, where r is, of course, this big distance wherever that is, right? Wherever it is from the center. But integrating over a is a bit annoying, right? Because we don't have a generalized expression. It'd be much better if we could somehow integrate over theta and r. So let's do that. Now, some people will just integrate over r, We'll, we'll convert the area to pi dr squared and then you get uh, 2r dr. I prefer to do kind of the engineer's way and introduce more variables with the notion that they're just gonna disappear anyway. Okay, so let's imagine we have this, whoop, I didn't mean to rub all that out. <laughs> let's imagine we have this little bit of area, right? This little bit of area and let's treat it like a rectangle. And what I mean by this is that even though yes, it's probably like a segment of a circle, it's such a small, it's so infinitesimal that we can assume that this length and this length are the same, right? And we can kind of assume that there's no, it's, it, we don't really need to assume that it kind of looks like a weird trapezoid, right, is what I'm saying. We'll treat it like a rectangle. If we're gonna treat it like a rectangle, right, then we can treat it as a width multiplied by a depth. So the, if I wanted to talk about this little rectangle or circle segment, well, the, the length or the kind of the depth would be dr, right? So that it's a little element of radius times a little element of pseudo circumference, right? Pseudo circumference. So essentially we're asking what's this distance here, 
right? Now, if you remember your degrees, your circles stuff, I don't know, uh, you'll recall that the entire circumference of something is two pi r, right? But let's imagine that this is some arc length theta, right? And it's small enough that the fact that I'm drawing them as two diverging lines is not true, right? Like we can treat them as kind of straight lines. This width that is perpendicular to dr, we could refer to as r d theta, right? Because that's what that length is, right? It's whatever r is at this point, right? Times an infinitesimal element of theta. Now, you see, this is gonna end up being the same thing as two pi r dr, right? Because we're gonna integrate d theta over two pi, but this is, you know, not thinking too much, if that makes sense. We don't have to think too hard about doing this sort of thing. So, we'll take that. We've got dA is now equal to r dr d theta. Okay, that's, that's, our, that's our next conversion. So an infinitesimal area is equal to infinitesimal radius multiplied by this infinitesimal width, which is r d theta. I don't know why I did r d r d theta, but I did. And so let us now construct our integral. We can delete this, All right? get rid of this stuff. And now let's put our integral back together. So now we have i is equal to the integral of, now I'm gonna do two variables, right? It's the integral of r squared, that was our starting point, right? times r dr d theta. Now we've got to put the limits on our integral, right? So on our integral, we're going to have, uh, essentially because we have two variables that we're integrating across now, we'll have two integral signs, we have two limits. So theta goes from zero to two pi, fairly simple. And r goes from zero to the final radius, big R. Right? And we can integrate these one at a time, right? We can do theta first because it's much more simple, right? So let's integrate for theta first. I is equal to, uh, if you integrate d theta, we're going to get theta, right? Wow, shockers, no, no, um, no, no surprises there. So we're going to get uh, the integral between zero and r, r squared, R, I guess I could write that as R cubed. R cubed, sorry, I got an eraser. Why am I, why am I drawing that that way? R cubed, dr, r. The eagle eyed among you will notice I forgot that sigma all the way over there. Sorry, sorry about that sigma. I'll put it out the front. So this is sigma out the front because it's a constant, right? Multiplied by theta between the limits of zero and two pi, which is basically two pi. <laughs> Right? So we have now i is equal to two pi sigma integral zero to big R, R cubed dr. And this is fairly simple to integrate. So we're going to integrate that and we're going to get, that's two pi sigma R four over four between the limits of zero and R, which is just gonna come out as big R. So now we've got two pi sigma over four times r to the four. Now you might be like, hang on, that's not one half m r squared, is it? Right, no, it's not, but we'll get there. So first of all, I'll simplify, we'll just make that out to be one half pi sigma r squared r to the four. We'll see why I do this a little bit later, okay. And we want to ask, or you could, I mean, look, you can kind of see, sorry, that's R squared. You can kind of see what substitution is gonna have to be made to make these two equivalent, right? And that's another reason why I like having the answer nearby because it's, it's scaffolding for you in a way, right? Like you've got it in a structure that you know fits the answer and then you should go, what could pi R squared and sigma have to do with M, right? But of course we remember I am recording, good. I thought I was not recording for a second. Oh, I would freak out. All right, of course we remember that we defined sigma earlier. We defined sigma as the mass divided by the area, the total area. And what's the total area of a circle? 
it's pi r squared. So that's equal to m over pi big R squared. That's the total area of our disk circle. And that means that m is equal to sigma pi r squared. And so we can substitute that back in. And we now have 1 half m r squared as our moment of inertia, right? So it took me a few steps, but all of those steps were kind of simple, right? So just to kind of recap, first of all, we converted our dm into a sigma dA, where we have a definition of sigma, right? And maybe earlier I could have expressed it as m over pi r squared instead of leaving it as ma, just to make the, the next step easier. And then we converted our dA into r dr d theta, right? Now, other people won't do that. Other people will straight up convert dA into an element of straight up dr, right? But I'm, well, I'm just lazy, right? I like to do things in multiple variables. I like to do more steps with less thinking when I'm, when I'm learning, like when I'm starting out, right? Like I don't like to take shortcuts when I'm doing it for the first time or when I'm trying to understand it. So like when, when essentially I'm at your level, right? So that's what I recommend to you. Don't, don't take shortcuts yet, right? Obviously in an exam, you want to be competent enough to take shortcuts because there's a time pressure. But when you're practicing, there's no time pressure. So you may as well do the long way, do the kind of low brain way, and you know, you'll get the same result. So we had d theta and r dr. Um, I converted that r squared r into r cubed, brought the sigma out the front. But importantly, we realized that we can integrate d theta first, right? So notice here, we had a single integral, now we have a double integral. That's just because I had one element that I was integrating over area, and I split that up into two separate elements. And if I do that, you just split the integral up into two separate integrals. It doesn't matter, right? You don't have to kind of keep this, you don't have to start and end with the same number of integral signs, that's fine. So integrating d theta between zero and two pi, that's the easiest, right? That just comes out as two pi, right? It was two pi minus zero. Uh, and then we've got our limits of zero and r. And so we integrate r cubed between zero and r. We get r to the four over four between zero and r. Uh, and then, yeah, two pi. So I guess I guess the, the trick here was to realize that only, I was about to say only two of these r's matters. Only an r squared was meant to be at the end. So I separated it, right? And then went over here and looked, was like, oh, there's a, there's a thing here and there's this thing here. And then if I do a bit of rearranging, oh, those two are equivalent, right? Ta-da, we got it. That's supposed to be R, not a kind of weird P. Anyway, so that's the video. Um, I hope that was useful. Uh, I guess, I don't know, ask if you don't have, if you have any questions. If you're actually still watching this, I don't, I don't know why you'd still be watching this because this is just a teaching demo. But I don't know, thanks if you watched it.